Uh, we have three speakers this afternoon. Uh, first up, uh, Kurt Brorson. Uh, topic of his title, as you can see there, is the accuracy of density functional theory, atomization energies and densities and bonding regions correlated. With that, take it away, Kurt. Thank you. So, uh, I'm a postdoc in the Sharon Ham Schiffer lab. Uh, she's a Blue Waters professor at UIUC. She couldn't be here, so I'm going to talk about uh, what we've been doing on Blue Waters in like the last three or four months. So I'm a, our, our group does quantum chemistry broadly, and so what we're interested normally in our starting point in doing is solving the electronic Schrodinger equation written here, H psi equals E psi. Uh, this assumes a time independent potential from the normal uh, Schrodinger equation. We also have invoked the Born-Oppenheimer approximation, so we have nuclei that we treat classically just as point particles, and the electrons immediately adjust any perturbation. Uh, our Hamiltonian here for the system, we have kinetic energy of electrons, electron uh, classical nuclei attraction, electron-electron repulsion. Uh, so like you ever heard of Hartree-Fock theory, uh, it starts from here, and a lot of quantum chemistry in the last 60 years is kind of built on this equation. The, the problem is the wave function is a function of three NE variables, where NE is the number of electrons, and so it's a very complex function, and it's very difficult to solve for. So, uh, like the gold standard of quantum chemistry, uh, couple clusters, singles, doubles, and triples, has very poor scaling. So it scales into the seventh, where n is a, a rough measure of system size. Uh, an alternative way of doing quantum chemistry, then, instead of working with a, a wave function, uh, you can work with a density. And this is because of what's called the Hohenberg Cone theorem from the 60s. So it says the external potential, V external, is uniquely determined by the ground state electronic density. In this case, the external potential is just the classical nuclei, so it's all the non-quantum particles. Uh, and the reason this is nice is the density is a function of three variables instead of three NE variables, and so it's a much simpler entity to use. And then from the Hohenberg Cohen theorem, you can do some extra math and show that the uh, energy of the system, which is normally what we're ultimately interested in chemistry, kind of calculating energy differences, products minus reactants, or stuff like that, the energy itself is a functional of the density. And what that really means is if I know the density and I have this functional, I can calculate the energy from the density directly and avoid using the wave function. So the, like most people in chemistry that are outside of computational chemistry, when you talk about computational chemistry, they really think of density functional theory as kind of like the base method. Uh, a lot of people still use these wave function methods, uh, but DFT is kind of ubiquitous in quantum chemistry. And so people use the density instead of the wave function as kind of the, the base quantity. So the way DFT is normally implemented is through something called the Cohn-Sham formalism. So what we have are what are called Bach-like equations of a non-interacting system. So this is just an eigenvalue expression where each of these four terms is a functional of the density. Uh, from this, we get solutions. Uh, so these kind of correspond to molecular orbitals and normal wave function theory. We can take the square and sum them up to get the density. And so we just have this eigenvalue equation that we solve. Uh, computationally, the, getting these first three terms are very easy. Uh, the first term is just the kinetic energy. The second term is the external potential that I talked about earlier. This third term is called the Hartree term, so it's just uh, classical electrostatics, so electron-electron repulsion. And then this uh, fourth term is called the exchange correlation potential, and it includes all effects that are not included in the first three terms. So DFT is a fundamentally exact theory. So like all the many body effects uh, of quantum mechanics are, are included in this VXC. And while this is an exact theory, the fact that it's exact, the, the proof of it uh, was a proof of existence. It wasn't a proof of construction. And so no one really knows the exact form of the exchange correlation potential. And so the, really like the bulk of, of DFT research is coming up with new approximations and maybe better approximations uh, for, for this exchange correlation potential. So uh, how do we do that? Well, first we're going to talk about this concept of Jacob's ladder in DFT. So there's kind of like a hierarchy of functionals uh, that, that we have, and they all depend on different inputs. Uh, so uh, the reason it's called Jacob's ladder, this comes from John Perdue, and the idea is uh, like in the Old Testament in the Bible, we're climbing up the ladder to kind of reach density functional theory heaven, uh, where at the very top it's like the most accurate possible thing we can do. Uh, and so at the bottom rung, we have this thing called LDA, or local density approximation, which just depends on the density. And then as we ascend the rungs, we add extra input variables. So on the second rung, for GGA, or generalized gradient approximation, we add uh, gradient information. On the third rung, for meta-GGAs, we add uh, the Laplacian of the density, or kinetic energy, uh, kinetic energy density. And on the fourth and fifth rungs, we add uh, information about the occupied or virtual orbitals, respectively. So typically, functionals get more accurate as you go up these rungs, because they contain extra information. Uh, they also become more complex 
And they also normally uh, computationally take more time as you ascend this ladder. Uh, so that's kind of a, a hierarchy of functionals, but how do we actually develop them? I, I've kind of grouped this into two broad schools, which maybe isn't fair, but uh, I have what's called the Purdue School here, named after John Purdue at uh, Temple now. And he uses physical constraints, or people that do this use physical constraints and properties of the exact functional. So while we don't know what the exact functional is, we can prove certain properties of it. So like if I kind of squish or pull apart the density, I know the exchange correlation functional should behave in a certain way. Uh, and, and that's what he does. And so he, there's various other constraints and he seeks to construct a functional that satisfies these. I have this quote from someone in my group that says, in DFT for a very smart person, it's very difficult to do anything. Uh, he said this about a year ago somewhat flippantly. He's a research professor. And what he's, to Mike, Mike's a, a mathematical physicist. To him, a, a smart person is someone that really wants to have physical rigor in his function, or uh, in his science. And so what he's saying is it's really hard to derive functionals that satisfy these physical constraints. And while they've been very accurate, it's really hard to keep coming up with new ones, and there's no really systematic way to go about it. And so there's a lot of really smart people that want to do this, and they've really struggled to keep developing functionals. Uh, and so that's, that's what that means. So this is kind of where DFT functional development started. Uh, more recently, there's been what we're calling the Trular School, named after Don Trular at the University of Minnesota, where you just kind of have some fi fixed functional form with a bunch of parameters, and then you just fit those parameters uh, to optimize some property against empirical data, whether that be like a heats of formation, atomization energy, transition uh, barrier heights, maybe even bond links. And so you just have a bunch of parameters and you just find the best set of them. Uh, these are the Minnesota functionals of Don Trular and some of the more recent Head Gordon functionals uh, from Berkeley have been very successful with this approach as well. Uh, these have typically given very good energies and uh, they kind of started maybe in the early 2000s and they've really come to dominate functional development uh, to where m more, most of the recent functionals really kind of do something like this. Uh, where, and the number of parameters has kind of uh, exploded, some might say, to where like the most recent uh, Trular functionals contain upwards of 50 parameters. And so uh, it's been very powerful, but you kind of lose some of the physics behind it when you do it. So no matter how we develop functionals, uh, Functionals are typically focused on improving energies in systems, and that's because chemists are really normally interested in relative energies. Uh, you can think of like, you know, just products minus reactants where the chemical reaction happened, and we're wanting to find the energy of that reaction. There's some exceptions to this, but, but broadly that's true. And when we look at functionals, so this is from a Trular paper where uh, it's the errors in energies for functionals developed in different decades uh, for a test set of molecules that the Errors and energies have decreased over the decades. And so you can really see that that's where the focus has lied. Uh, one thing we know about the exact functional, though, is that it should give the exact density as well as the exact energy. Uh, and so the, uh, one idea of John Perdue, who was in this recent study in science, uh, looked at recent function, or, or looked at a bunch of functionals to see if they give good densities as well as energies. And he did not find that, and so he's called into question whether DFT has strayed from the path of trying to approximate the exact functional. Because in John Perdue's uh, uh, head, or, or uh, his philosophy, that we know we should be trying to approximate the exact functional, so we should be getting better densities and energies and not just energies. And so the way they did that was they looked at atomic densities using DFT, and they showed that up into the year 2000, atomic densities got better, but then starting in the year 2000 with these rise of these highly parameterized functionals, densities started getting worse. Uh, to where like the Trular and Minnesota functionals really started in 2005, and so there are a lot of these functionals over here that give very poor atomic densities. Um, so this study uh, was really high profile, so you know, quantum chemists kind of exist in their own little weird world inside the chemistry community to where uh, we don't necessarily publish in a high profile journal like science very much, to where this article was, was well discussed and uh, well noticed by the broader community, but it, and it was useful, but it had some uh, obvious improvements to, to it. And uh, what we did was uh, basically uh, wanted to do those improvements. And so the first thing we wanted to do was we wanted to look at molecules and not atoms. So the, the uh, systems in the studies were highly charged atoms, which means the electron density was really localized around the nucleus. Uh, and for chemistry, we don't really care about the density in this nucleus or in this core region. And that's because when chemical reactions happen, the densities in those regions really don't change. 
So quantum chemistry really doesn't do a great job, uh, no matter what, of getting the densities in these core regions. But when we do energy differences, we should just subtract out those errors. So where really the errors in quantum chemistry calculations come from what's like the valence region or the bonding region, so regions far from the nuclei. And this wasn't the region of space that they were looking at in this study. So really we want to look at molecules and not atoms with the idea that maybe these modern functionals that give good energies, they're giving good energies because they're giving good densities in these like chemically relevant region of space. Uh, the other thing we want to do is we want to use a consistent energy metric. So the study used the molecular energies from that uh, uh, graph I showed about three slides ago, but it looked at atomic densities. And so it's possible that the modern functionals don't really give a good density for these atomic systems. So they weren't comparing apples to apples. So we want to look at these, uh, some molecules, and we want to look at energies for those molecules relative to the densities for those molecules. Uh, the last thing is we want to focus on a single density error metric. This is kind of a technical thing. This is a, a graph from the paper. They looked at a mixture of the, uh, the density, the gradient of the density, and Lagrangian of the density, and then kind of summed these together in, in an average. Uh, and, and they had good reasons for that, but it's way simpler just to look at the density because all functionals use density as an input. Uh, and we know if we get the exact density correct, we're going to get the gradient of the density and Lagrangian of the density correct as well. So what did we actually do? Uh, we looked at 14 closed shell diatomics. Uh, we used a smaller test set of functionals than they did in the original study just because we don't have access to the newest versions of QChem or, uh, or Gaussian. I think we used about 100 different functionals. Uh, and then for our air metrics, we, uh, for the density air, so right here I have a lithium dimer shown. And I have the density plotted just on this line right here. So this is like a 1D slice of the density. We have something called the on-axis density. And so for the on-axis density, what I'm going to do is compute the root mean squared density for each functional relative to couple cluster, which is a highly accurate benchmarking method. And I'm going to select the 15% of points that are lowest. So we're going to kind of define that as our bonding region so we can kind of avoid the density in these core regions that I, I really don't care about. So in this case, since this molecule is symmetric, it's going to be just the points in, in this region right here. Uh, and that can meet the uh, root mean squared difference for the densities relative to couple cluster. Uh, we also have something called the off-axis density error. And for that, I'm going to look at the point of lowest density on the on-axis density and then just take a plane. So in this case, since this molecule is symmetric, it's going to be the plane through here. And once again, compute the RMSD relative to couple cluster. Uh, so I have an on-axis and off-axis density measure that we think kind of uh, encapsulates the, the density in the bonding region. Uh, you know, it is arbitrary, but we think it correctly does that. Uh, from there, I can calculate just a single number for density error of the functional, where I take the on and off-axis uh, density errors and I divide through the median for all functionals just to kind of normalize them relative to each other. So if the on-axis density error on average happened to be like 10 times higher, it wouldn't dominate the off-axis density error. So it's just kind of a normalization thing. So that's what we're finally going to call our density error. Uh, for our atomization energy error, it's just uh, mean absolute atomization energy error relative to couple cluster averaged over all the molecules. So for that, uh, we're going to graph the year versus density error. So this kind of corresponds to the uh, graph from the previous study. And we see an increase starting in the year 2000, very similar to what they saw. Uh, our uh, increase is less pronounced, but it's still there. And part of the reason it's less pronounced is it's due to the different measure of, of density error. So if you regraph their data with just the density error instead of their average of the density, the grade, and the Laplacian, you get something that looks more similar to this, uh, to where we think even part of the reason they used that measure was because it increased uh, the increase in error starting from the year 2000. So uh, we broadly agree with what they see. Uh, if we want to look at uh, actual, the list of density errors, so this is a lot of data to where it's maybe more of interest to an actual chemist, uh, and uh, we have a broad audience here, but really the take home here is uh, a lot of these are these common three parameter hybrid functionals that are very widely used in quantum chemistry, and they really do a great job of, of getting the air, or the getting the density right for molecular systems. And for the list of worst performing functionals, so all these with an M on the front uh, are the Minnesota functionals of, of Don Trular that were uh, done well, using uh, parameterization or unconstrained optimization. And while these are widely used and give great energies, we see even from molecular systems that they don't really give a good density for molecular systems. So what we're really interested, though, is seeing the correlation between the atomization energy error and the density, and so we graph those on the same graph. Uh, for LDA, GGA, and double hybrid GGA-type functionals, we don't see any correlation between atomization energy error and density error. 
And that's just because there's no variance in the density error. So all of them kind of have a, a very similar density error. For uh, meta-GGAs, we see positive correlation, uh, which is kind of what we want and, and what we should be getting if we're uh, approximating the exact functional. So when the uh, atomization energy error goes down, the density error goes down likewise. But what's interesting is for hybrid functionals, which is a lot of what the modern functionals are, are typically hybrid functionals, uh, we don't see any correlation between uh, atomization energy error and density error, but we also see variance in the density error. So what we did was we sorted the hybrid GGA functionals by the year developed, and we used the early, uh, early 2000s, or actually just year 2000, as our dividing point because that's when we saw the upward trend and that's when the last paper saw the upward trend. And for that, we can see a clear change in the correlation uh, between atomization energy error and density error. So for functionals before the year 2000, uh, they're clearly highly correlated. But post-2000, they all give very accurate atomization energies, but they've stopped giving accurate densities. Um, and so it's kind of hard to say why this is. Uh, it, it has something to do with the, high, uh, the parameterization, but clearly functionals that are more recent and, uh, and developed in the last 15 years have sacrificed an accurate density to maybe get a, a different kind of properties uh, instead. Uh, and, and what those may be, uh, like they could maybe want to get like time-dependent properties correct, or they maybe they want to get bond links more correct. But they're clearly not getting densities correct, which uh, someone like John Perdue would argue that the functionals should really be getting both correct. So, uh, so conclusions and acknowledgments. So really, in a way, we, we didn't learn anything new that we didn't already know from the atomic studies, but it was really a necessary extension because the atomic studies were kind of incomplete uh, and weren't necessarily totally relevant for chemistry. And so while we agree with them, uh, it, it was really important that, that we did this. Uh, and then the decoupling of diatomic density errors and atomization energy errors for hybrid functionals uh, started in about the early 2000s, which is really when this rise of highly parameterized functionals began. So some we talked about doing in the future. Uh, we talked about doing larger molecules, but instead of looking at the density like over all of space, maybe we could just look at the density of a specific type of bond. So you can imagine looking like at a carbonyl bond or maybe an amide type bond and looking just at the density of that, because maybe certain functionals do better for certain types of bonds. So where if you're like looking at certain types of reactions, that could be important. Uh, we've been kicking around other ideas similar to that, but we really haven't pushed on any of that yet. So uh, I'm at UIUC, and this was done in collaboration with, with other group members. So Yan Yan is a postdoc. Mike Pack, who I quoted earlier, is a research professor. And Sharon Ham Schiffer is a PI on the project who kind of headed it all up. So, uh, this work was funded by the NSF and uh, run on Blue Waters, and we're very thankful for the computer time there. So with that, I'm happy to take any questions.